They're saying it's good. So we're good to go. So Mr. Rob Earth, I appreciate you being here. For anybody who is new, my name is Rob Carney. This is the Whole Health Connections podcast. And Ra has been a guest on my show before. He was actually guest number 17. I think this is over two years ago at this point. So there's been a lot of growth within both of us over the course of that time. And so anybody who's not familiar with Mr. Rob Earth, he is the owner of CareerTheWeek.com. He has previously owned several gyms in downtown L.A., he has degrees in psychology and exercise science, and he is a top leader in the Superfoods Network marketing company called Purium, which we have been working with together for quite some time. So today we're going to be talking about manifesting abundance. And this came up as I was actually reaching out to Rob because that's been a challenge for me. And I think it's very relatable to a lot of people that coming up with an upbringing, upbringing living in the suburbs of Boston, you know, Boston's a very blue collar town, a lot of working class people, a lot of people who are kind of scraping to get by and, and really having trouble, um, you know, manifesting that abundance. I think that we often pride ourselves on being able to work through the struggle and kind of doing the doing the hard things to get by. So it's, it's a lot of it's in the culture, but recognize we don't have to accept that as the way that we go about things and recognizing that sometimes I have a challenge overcoming that Boston mentality at times and stepping into my place of abundance. So Ra is going to be sharing a lot of his wisdom that he has learned over his life experience to work with me and kind of like a little one-on-one therapy session that hopefully all you beautiful people can resonate with as well. So Ra, happy to have you here, my friend. Awesome. I'm super excited to be here with you, Rob. We work together in Purium. Uh, so that's that's a relationship we have. And a lot of that has to do with manifesting abundance, right? We are helping people and supporting people and serving people, but also our own inner journeys within our business is something that we get to work with. Because in our business, we have unlimited potentiality, unlimited potential to serve people to make impact and unlimited potential in finances. And within that construct, we find ourselves presented with our relationship with money because it's, it's uh, apparent that our relationship with money is manifesting in the success of our business, right? The more we are still kind of stuck in the, I'm worth, uh, you know, $1,500 to $3,000 a month. That's, that's where we're going to be stuck at, right? That's where our business is going to, to top out at. And if we top out at, you know, $20,000 a month, that's what we think that we're worth. Then that's what we're going to be getting paid. It's very rare that a person gets paid more than they think that they're worth. And so the beauty about our business with Perium, it's network marketing, is that there is no cap, which I mentioned. Uh, and so we get to see how much we really truly believe and think that we're worth because it's presented every month to us in the form of money in the bank. And so you mentioned something, Rob, that I wanted to start with which is you said you were from Boston and it's kind of a working class city and, and I'm from Michigan and it's the same thing. You, you go to work and you trade your time for money and there's, there's pretty much, you know, you fall in the range between as an adult, maybe like 13 to $20 an hour, right? Like that's reasonably a, a, like maybe $30 an hour, but if you fall, you know, if you're getting above $30 an hour, you're, you're successful. Uh, and you fall into this, this cat, you categorize yourself of what you're worth. And so that's how I was in Michigan. When I moved to California, that contract got completely destroyed when I started seeing people not work and getting paid more money than I, I, I ever imagined, you know, so this trading time for money versus, is there some other way like those constructs need to be looked at. And so let's just start with like, with that. Um, and I want to, I want to start with what do you think you deserve? Right? So an easy way to do this is, have you ever made a vision board? I have, but it's been quite some time, so I'm definitely due for a new one. 
So, I mean, we might be able to answer this question if you think about the vision board that you made, but if you looked outside right now and somebody drove by in a Lamborghini, or let's say you go to, there's probably like a wealthier area of your town, right? If you go into those areas and you look at the houses, like what is your relation? What goes through your mind when you look at either your vision board or you look at like a three million dollar house? Like what? What goes through your mind when you're in that scenario? Yeah, that's a great question. And I definitely recognize that I think a lot of times growing up, it was kind of some some sort of idea of, oh, that they don't need a house that big it was kind of the mindset I had growing up. It's like, oh, this no one needs a house that big, you know, kind of coming from the middle class. We tend to see or we I saw very wealthy people as they don't need all that. That's excessive, that type of mentality. But now as I I become aware of that, that reaction. Now it's kind of looking at these houses as wow, that's a really nice house. I'm curious what they do for a living is often a question I think of when I see these houses. And I think, you know, maybe I want a part of that house, but not the other part. And I kind of now look at it from a taking the pieces that I like about it and how I would use that in my own home. Um, and for from the vision board perspective, the main goal is to have a homestead with a retreat center on it. Um, that I'm growing a lot of my own food. I'm able to work on my own hours um, remotely and have the freedom to travel when I want to. Okay. So let's, let's step back to that's excessive. They don't need a house that big. Where do you think that comes from? Was it like, where do you think that program got implanted into you? Probably my parents. Because you're not born having that as a reaction. Right. So it had to come from somewhere, whether it's one place or three places or many places. But if you were to make a list of where that came from, where do you think that would come from? I'd say parents, grandparents, um, friends, friends, parents, essentially the people that were, you know, a major factor in my life in childhood. Do you remember any specific scenario? where they may have said a comment uh, that would lead you to think that having money is wrong because that's where that's excessive or they don't need a house that big, right? It's almost, it's not, it's not even neutral. You're, you're in sort of uh, putting shame towards somebody that has money and if we look into David Hawkins' work, David Hawkins has written, doc, is it Dr. David Hawkins? I don't know if he's a doctor, I forget. Um, but he's written many books on the levels of consciousness. And we are familiar with things like shame and guilt being lower on that level of levels of consciousness and, and things like joy and love being higher. And there's all in between but shame is actually the lowest state of consciousness than that one can be in the lowest. It's, it's really close to death in terms of like vibratory frequency. Not that death is a low state. It just means that it's unable to sustain life. So assigning shame to somebody who has money, that's number one, a very strong imprint. And it's also detrimental. So can, so, what I want to do now is have you search your memories, your feelings, and is there a way that you can bring up to the surface something that would have started this program that having money is shameful? Hmm. So the first, as soon as you said, the first thing that came up is so kind of a little paint the picture here in the town I grew up with, we had two different trailer parks. And we also had a couple areas that had multi-million dollar houses. So it was very extreme in a small, small town. So you can drive 10 minutes from a trailer park to multi-million dollar houses. So I remember there'd be times, you know, around Christmas time that we would drive around and look at all the lights on people's houses. And a lot of these houses were the giant houses that have all the lights, they have all the, like the blow up stuff. And I remember we go there because we like the lights, but there's always that, you know, kind of the parents saying, oh, you know, those houses are so big. This is absurd. Kind of. So was, I kind of remember that memory is driving on Christmas to see Christmas lights and then kind of have my parents kind of, you know, throw shade at the, you know, the really wealthy people. 
Then the other thing is having some friends that did live in the trailer homes, just kind of, you know, hanging out from there. There was also a lot of that, um, you know, mentality of, you know, kind of that scarcity mentality, kind of the victimhood mentality and projecting onto kind of, you know, it's the rich people's fault um, per se. So those are the two immediate things that come up. Um, I'm sure if I, that's great with it, but that's great. So at least we know the origin of the program, you know, at least one of the origins. And then basically everything that gets added on to that, you know, maybe a teacher says something about wealthy people ruining the, the society or something like it just adds validation onto that program. And as you become an adult, we're, we're essentially running the programs that we have adapted in our formative years of life. And without knowledge, number one, that we're running the program, number two, where it originates with, and number three, having the, the awareness of how to change that program without, without that, that happening, those program programs are going to keep on cycling. And those cycles are going to keep you in your state of being. And in this case, we're talking about abundance, but I'm just going to to start with, we're we're starting with, you know, money, right? So we're talking about abundance in the form of money. And I just want to say that, yes, I know that there's many different forms of abundance. We can have abundance in your relationship life, uh, in your connection to nature. You can have abundance in happiness, all of that is true. And I feel like a lot of people use that to hide behind facing their weakness in their relationship with money. So people who don't have money say, well, I've got abundance in, you know, being able to connect with nature. That's great. That's great that you're really good at that. But let's not use that as a mask to face maybe the poor relationship that we have with money. So we're going to be talking about the word money a lot. And if, and if you Rob or anybody listening or watching feels a little allergic to that word, then this is why we're doing this, this talk, right? Because a lot of people are allergic to money. They have been raised by parents who, uh, told them that, you know, pointed the fingers and said, that's wrong. Or maybe they have had money in their life, like an abundance of money, like I did when I owned the gyms and I eventually got sick of it and I got allergic to money and I decided to, to live my life without money. And that lasted a few years before I decided to come back and reconnect with it and be productive in society. And as a productive member of society, you are valued and with value comes energy exchange and that's currency, which is the dollar bills that we use to provide more value to society. And so you have a program written. Did you live in the trailer parks or were you kind of like in between? No, I mean, we growing up, you know, we lived in a town that was not as well off then when I was about 10 years old we moved to this town that kind of had the diversity of the two but we were in a you know middle class average size house okay so when it comes so we the, we titled this manifesting abundance right so manifesting has a lot to do with creating but it's going to be impossible to create anything if we are still held within our current dynamics of reality. And so having this thought, which I think you're getting over, right? But I just want to, I'm, I'm going back as if you weren't, right? Like as if you still think the things that you do about, you know, a mansion. And manifesting has, is impossible to do if we're still tied to our programs uh, that were that made up our old reality. And so the way I relate with reality is that there's infinite potentials, right? So the universe is filled with information. So if you were to think of like a computer system, a computer system is is data, right? And data can be transmitted, can go from here to the other side of the world. 
but data represents potentialities. And what pops up on your computer screen is whatever the controller wants to manifest out of the potential data, right? So the data doesn't all exist um, on the computer screen, right? There's not like a zillion computer screens, and then you have to go look at different computer screens. You just bring that data into your computer screen and the data exists almost infinitely in the system. And if we view reality from that construct that this reality is formed, just like we form, let's call it matter onto the computer screen, this reality is formed into matter from infinite possibilities of data, which is really light. And as the controller of our reality, the way that we form reality is shaped around our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions. That will shape the infinite potentials into an actual physically formed reality. So we do have to make sure that our thoughts and feelings are, are aligned to what we want to create, and we have to release these attachments. So what I suggest people do if they have this allergic reaction to money is start with small, start with small things. So we do have to, we do have to feel joy and love around the things that we do have around the impact that we have and, and the person that we are. And we want to start looking at the things in our life in a different way. So Instead of looking at, you know, if we look at the millionaire house and we think that's too much, that's excessive, we shouldn't have that, which is, you know, with pollution and, and all of these things, we can legitimize those thoughts. But then when we look at our own life, you know, when we look at our own life, we want to start translating the things that we have into luxury and start feeling good about luxury. So I'm just looking in your room right now that you're in right now that looks like a pretty nice room, right? And so you've got healthy plants, you've got water delivered there and glass jugs. You wanna start recognizing the luxury in your life and have that start dissolving the shame that you might have about nice things. So you wanna start recognizing the nice things in your life and almost amplify it amplify the fact that you get glass jugs of water delivered to your house as if you deserve it and you appreciate it and you're grateful for it. And that's going to start reflecting out into your reality in a way where now when you see other people with nice things, you're going to be grateful and, and, and aligned with that state of being. And then that's going to create a vortex where you're noticing the beauty in abundance and it's going to start dissolving the shame that you have associated with abundance because there's no way that anyone's going to manifest abundance if there's shame in the system and we have to start looking at our life as abundance and so this is kind of like it works on multiple levels we have to look at our life as abundant if we want to be abundant and so right now, if you're thinking about your life as, I wish my car was better, what is that? That's uh, shame and grief and desire, right? Those are all lower emotions. As opposed to thinking, I wish my car was better, recognize that you live in the year 2022, and we basically have like magic to be able to get into this thing that we call a vehicle and drive 100 miles and be there in like 90 minutes, we can be in another place on earth that used to take days to get there on horse or walking. And it's just like, just start recognizing the beauty of the abundance that we have. Start writing the relationship to abundance within your current life. That way, when you see other abundance, you have a good association with it because you're, we are going to continue to not have money if we're allergic to money, if we shame it. 100%. And, and I think, you know, to your point there, it is just kind of the mindset shift of looking for the little things. And that's what I like is a practical first step. And that's something I'm always 
looking to share with people on the podcast. So what are some tangible, practical first steps that we can use? And just like you said, looking at the fact, I have beautiful plants in my home. I have fresh spring water and glass jugs. You know, we can start naming all these little things that maybe we tend to overlook because they become normalized. And I think that that's a big thing that I find myself doing is, is a lot of these nice things become normal. Like having nice plants, having fresh spring water is normal. So I tend to stop putting focus on that, but kind of what you're saying is continue to put the focus on that. Even when it's not the shiny object anymore, continue to give that, that feeling of abundance towards things, even if they are a normal part of your life. Right. And the great thing about doing this is you're going to start recognizing when other people enter your environment and start pointing at things and degrading them. And you're going to recognize very quickly who belongs, you know, who you're taking into this next reality and who's staying behind in the world that you came from. And it's going to happen, even if in the start, you need to sort of put effort into this and it feels like you're faking it. it it's a program. So as we run the program, as we have experience, it's going to start making neurological connections in your brain. And those are going to get stronger. It's going to feel more, uh, more like you. It'll feel less like you're faking it and more like you over time. Also, your hormonal responses are going to start to shift and you're going to start getting dopamine and serotonin produced just being in your life and you're going to be a happier person. And then when somebody comes in complaining about their job or complaining about the weather, or complaining about their boyfriend or girlfriend or their parents or this or that, it's like the distinction becomes stronger. And that's another thing. We do have to not only release our attachments to programs, but there's, there's other people running programs and associations have a lot to do with our manifested reality because we are co-creating this, right? It's not necessarily, hmm, how can I say this? Everybody is also, we're in this together. And so your tribe of people, uh, and I also roll with the, the, paradigm that we're all one and we're all kind of like going in and out of each other's reality based on your own personal journey. And so you do want to attract the people around you and they will be attracted to you, right? They will, they, if you used to get with your friends and talk about how crappy the day was, and now you're not doing that anymore, you're not going to resonate with them anymore. You're not going to be resonating with their constructed reality and you're going to eventually bump into somebody who you might have never noticed before they might not have noticed you but you guys will attract to each other and form a new reality does that make sense it does make sense and you know i've shared this before on, on my show is that a couple of years ago um i had to put some distance between myself and a lot of my high school friends because we were really growing in two different directions. And that was a very difficult time for a lot of those people I'd known since I was, you know, nine years old. At this point, you know, this was a couple of years ago. So, you know, call it 15 years, I'd known a lot of these people, 17 years. And recognize, like you said, that when we were going to hang out, it was a lot of complaining. It was a lot of, you know, kind of bickering and kind of shaming and blaming each other and smoking weed, playing video games, drinking, eating crappy food, which those are all things I did in high school. And so I'm not going to sit here and pretend I've never done any of those things and that doing those things in moderation isn't the worst thing in the world. But when that became the norm, when we were hanging out, it got to a point where I recognized like, hey, this is not the direction I want to go. And sometimes there were a lot of uncomfortable conversations that came up, but ultimately it took me stepping away from that environment in order to create the space to meet more people. And it was almost like magic that as soon as I made the decision to have the tough conversations to distance myself, I then found other people that were actually kind of on the same wavelength as me. But had I been spending more time with these people that were no longer in alignment, I wouldn't have had the space in the bin with to meet these new people. So kind of like you're saying is sometimes we need to let go of something else in order to make room to, to make something new come in. It is magic. And it's, it's great that you recognize it as magic. So I mean, Magic is really the feminine aspect of logic. 
And so logic is wanting to know, you know, the science and, and the numbers behind everything. And, and they're, they're two opposite things. And so being able to, to recognize that there's something else beyond the, 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 the Western science, there's something else. And, and, and that's how we can relate to logic as opposed to logic. So let's, so we've talked about programs and releasing attachments. Let's talk about how to build faith because back to, you said you wanted a homestead, a retreat center. Sometimes when we think about our goals, they're, they're almost too big to, for us to grasp onto. So can you just, just so I can get some context, speak a little bit, like when you think about your ultimate goals, what, like, do you feel that you can do that? Like, what's your, where do you stand on like how you feel in your heart that you can be that is the resistance is like, what's coming up? Great question. So like you said, the ultimate goal is to have 40 plus acres with a fresh spring on the place, running water and have a homestead with a retreat center. The part that I can tangibly feel that, yes, I can achieve hundred percent is the homestead. Adding the retreat center part is definitely there's a little bit of a disconnect that it almost feels a little far fetched at this point. So part of my strategy, which I don't know if this is right or wrong, is to focus on manifesting the homestead piece first and then kind of taking it in chunks. So that's kind of where I'm at in that process right now. Okay, I like that strategy. Um, And that's something different. But I'm going to focus on there's this when we think about like a vision board or just an idea of what we want, usually because it's in a different reality than where we are right now, our brain starts to think, whoa, 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 hold on. Whoa, like this seems impossible, right? You, you can't do this. You haven't done it before. And so that's a evolutionary and that's an evolutionary process of our brain. So our brain it has just simplified three aspects. This is super simplified. So it's just relating to what I'm talking about. Three, it's got three modes. It's got positive, negative, and neutral. All right. And our, our so if you think about like wanting to cross the road, our positive brain is going to tell us the benefits of crossing the road over there. This is what there is, right? That's our positive brain, our negative brain, which isn't necessarily quote bad, but our negative brain keeps us alive. It's going to tell us about the dangers of crossing the road. You might get hit by a car. It might not be good as you imagine. It would be better if you just stay where you are and not do what the positive brain wants you to do. And so we've got these two things. It's kind of like a dichotomy. It's they're, they're, they're fighting each other. The neutral brain is going to be neutral of positive or negative. And it's going to be focusing on the experience that you're having essentially now. So it's just kind of like experiencing life. And so again, with this knowledge, what we can do and I've, I, I've learned how to hack this. So the hack is that the negative brain is non-existent in our memories because evolutionarily speaking, there would be no need for the negative brain for things that have already happened. Okay. And When it comes to manifesting abundance, one of the primary things is for us to feel in alignment with the abundance. The negative brain is the enemy to being able to feel secure in our intended realities, right? So when you're thinking homestead, retreat center, 40 plus acres, right? Let's just, if you think 400 plus acres, you can hear your negative brain getting stronger in that, right? Like 
400, like how much is that going to cost? That's going to cost 10 times as much. And on top of that, you need a fresh spring. Why not a waterfall? Right? So, so your negative brain pops up to tell you, Hey, you're going to get hit in the road if you're going for that. Cause it just seems like a very, 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 very long road to cross. So what we can do to align our heart, our feelings to this is think about, imagine, visualize this as a memory. And that's going to allow you to feel what it's like to have a retreat center, 40 plus acres, homestead, where you grow your own food, probably solar, whatever other technology you have that's natural. And, and, you know, family, whatever you want. So if you think about that as a memory, so you bring that vision behind you. So if you imagine, let's say six months ago, you signed the deed to 90 acres at, where is this going to be at, Rob? Do you know? Now What's the environment look like? Yeah, I've narrowed it down to Virginia or Florida. It's going to be on the East Coast. It's going to be a little bit warmer than Boston. Um, but Virginia and Florida, the two I've narrowed it down to. All right. So trees, big sky, you know, like feel the air, feel it as a memory. Like you just signed the deed. You went through this whole process of buying a house that you never went through before. It's your dream house. You did that six months ago and you're you know, meeting with the contractor last week to talk about plans for the retreat center. When you start taking this vision and you translate it into a memory, I'll just give you a few moments to do that. Like think about it as if it's already happened. What that does is it allows you to connect with the feelings without that negative brain chattering in there. And those feelings are what you're going to use as a map. So once you have those feelings imprinted, so now this is a program, just like earlier, we we're talking about unwriting programs. This is a, another program that we want to imprint into our being and then that's going to allow us to know which directions to go when we are presented with choices in life, right? So without knowing what it feels like to have a retreat center, 40 acres, fresh spring water, without knowing what it feels like, if you've never been able to sit and meditate in that reality without the chatter of it hasn't happened yet. What are you thinking? You don't deserve this without knowing what, what it feels like. It's going to be more, there's going to be more obstacles in your way to met, to, to pull that intention, that reality, right? So that's a reality that's out of infinite realities. You have tension on that reality. And the more that we can hold on and tighten that tension with our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions, then we will pull that intended reality into our current state of being. And so feelings are a part of that. And so if you do this practice and you meditate on it as it already happens, it's in your heart. And then when reality pops up, you almost get that, like, you can feel like a guitar string, the, the directions that you are to go. And that's where things like intuition come into this. And yes, this is different than logic, right? This is logic. So these are just tools that I use personally, and I've been using them for over 20 years to manifest things into my life. Not all, always money, but manifest many different things in terms of every single life scenario that you can think of recognizing the feeling state by having it be a memory will be a shortcut. It's almost like it speeds up the process. Mm. So I like what you're saying about like the logic and the magic or the magic. And that to me really stands out as very profound because when I think about, you know, the path forward, I recognize that logic has gotten me this far, 
but now it's time to balance that out with something else. Cause I come from a very logical perspective. My dad's an accountant. A lot of things are by the numbers. A lot of things kind of go, you know, linearly in, in some regard. And so when I think about the projection forward, it's like, okay, so my business grew 15% last year. So then I start calculating at 15%, how long it would take me to get to that rate. But then I recognize that that is not how it has to be. And that's one thing I think is really phenomenal about the Purian business models that, as you've said before, it's intended to be exponential growth. So oftentimes I find that I can limit myself with my logical linear thinking because I'm not giving the space for that, that magic to create, that magic to take space, that exponential growth to happen because I'm so focused on the linear. So that's where I, it's like you said, balancing that masculine and feminine energy is really the space that I'm stepping into right now is having, allowing myself to embrace that feminine. And I think that surrounding myself with people who are on that same frequency, especially specifically more women, you know, having some more of that balanced feminine energy in my life has been immensely helpful. Uh, you know, my girlfriend and I, we moved in here together last April. So it'll be, it's been about nine months or so. And definitely being around that feminine energy She's a great balancing force to me who's often way too logical, way too focused on, you know, the, the masculine step. So um, I just wanted to point out, I really like the, the distinction between the logic and the, and the logic, as you called it. Right. And within our, our business framework, your state of being is going to be duplicated down into your organization, Right. In network marketing, we build organizations and, and we bring in people and we essentially support them and we support them to build a business where they're helping people and they're also manifesting their own financial freedom within our compensation plan. And so the way that you're thinking about this business, Rob, if you're thinking, okay, 15% last year, that means 15% this year. That's coming through in your interactions with your team. And that's not necessarily something that you want to come through. Network marketing is an exponentially growing structure. It like that's the natural form of network marketing is that it's going to grow exponentially. And so always having that in the front of your mind that you're going to enroll some people and you're going to teach them and they're going to enroll some people. And then all of those people are going to enroll people. And you're going from like a small organization to a very, very, very big organization very quickly is not, it's, it's not, it's not guaranteed to happen that way. But it most certainly won't happen that way if that belief isn't there. And really, it will happen that way when everything comes in tune, right? Like when the systems are set up, when the mindset and the, and the feeling state of everybody joining into your organization is set up so that everybody has clarity to know what they need to do to serve people in order to grow their brand the Perium brand, the Perium mission, so that we can get these superfoods to people and support them with life-changing transformations, because that's essentially what we're doing at the end of the day. So we talked about, I'm just trying to remember, we talked about programs, we talked about releasing attachments, we talked about our feeling states, actions are next, Right. We do, and I just talked a little bit about like work, right? But a lot of the things that we that we do might be habits that we are carrying forth from our old sort of self that's holding us in the reality where we want to exit from. We want to go into something new. And so we want to make sure that we identify the good habits and the bad habits that we have. And, and I know I label them as good and bad. And we want to start making, which isn't necessarily true, but just for simplicity, so I don't have to explain that, good and bad habits. And we want to accentuate our ability to continue the good habits. And we want to make the bad habits difficult for us to continue. And 
the ways that we can make the bad habits difficult is in, you know, like when you're in a relationship, this gets, there's even one more dynamic, especially you're living with your girlfriend. It gets, it's one more dynamic that you need to consider because there is going to be some compromising that you have to do to maintain that, which we all get to do in this life, which is great. Uh, but from a simple standpoint, if we take the relationship out of it, an example of reducing the ability for ourselves to do bad habits is if we watch too much TV, then we can do things like take the batteries out of the remote. And so that way we're not just coming into the house and turning on the TV without thinking about it. We have to put the batteries in the remote. And every time we stop watching TV, we take the batteries out of the remote. So next time it triggers in our head, I'm about to do this thing that I know I don't need to be doing. And if that doesn't work, you can literally, every time you stop watching TV, take the TV out, unplug it, move it into a closet. Now the TV is not even there. And if you want to watch TV, you're basically increasing the difficulty and you're taking it out of sight for you to do this quote, bad habit. And it's just a time wasting habit that a lot of us have. And you guys probably all have this. So you just want to make your bad habits more difficult for you to do. Just set up barriers in your life, set up rules. Like whenever I'm done watching TV, I will unplug it and put it in the closet. You're not even telling yourself, stop watching TV. You're just setting up a program that will have impact on whether you want to take the TV out of the closet to watch it. And then same thing with your good habits. You want to set up programs so that your good habits are easier to do. They're in insight. You set up rewards. So if you do a good thing that you need to do for work, you also get to, you know, do something that you like doing, like eat your favorite food or something. So, so Rob, what I'm hearing from everything you're saying here is basically setting up our environment to promote growth and vitality essentially is what it comes down to is that you're creating an environment that is allowing ourselves to more easily fall into those good habits and make it more of an obstacle that we to go through a bunch of hoops to even engage in those bad habits. And so, you know, like you're saying, I find for me is that if I have my journal out on my desk before I go to bed, I'm much more likely to write in the morning than if it's somewhere out of sight, out of, out of mind. And it's the same thing with whatever that habit is. I know for a lot of people, it's maybe drinking water, you know, for clients and anytime I'm working with somebody it's hey, have water by your bedside. So you see it when you wake up and you remember to drink water, they don't get to work and say, oh crap, it's, you know, already 10 a.m. and I haven't had a, a glass of water yet. So it sounds like it's from my perspective, I'm hearing that it's just basically setting up our environment to be one that is promoting growth and making it difficult to dive into distractions. Yes. And that's going to free up a lot more time. Your schedule is actually going to open up. A lot of us feel like we don't have time, but it's because we're doing things that are counterproductive throughout our day. We're doing distracting things. And so looking and analyzing the environment and our schedule and, and, and looking at the things that take up time and, and setting up basically programs within our day. If I do this, I get to do this. Or if I do this, I don't get to do this. Like you just set up programs around your good and bad habits. Then you can start, you'll start recognizing that you can actually increase your good habits and set up systems so that you're doing what you need to do consistently. Because in order to manifest abundance, it's going to rely on a system of action, right? And so we've been talking about thoughts and feelings, and those are important, but that's not everything, right? Action activity is also going to need to be aligned with your thoughts and feelings in order for you to go in the direction that you can go in. If you're really good, you might be able just to think and feel a re reality. And then somebody knocks on your door and says, Hey, I've got a homestead with 40 acres and da, 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 da. you want it. You want to come live there tomorrow that can happen. And, and I've had that happen several times for me, but to start off thoughts, feelings, and actions as one unit is going to be 
where we have the most power. Eventually, you might, you, once you have that in alignment, once that's in alignment with yourself. So if you're already doing, if you're already thinking, feeling, and acting in a way that is of your greatest being, the moment that you have another thought, the feelings and actions are already there, you will create that reality almost instantaneously. But that takes having this framework strengthened and, and knowing what you should be, not should be, but what your greatest self is thinking, is feeling, is acting on and being that 100% of the day. And then when you have a feeling or you decide to change an action, manifestation will happen automatically. But in the beginning, we got to make sure to get all those in alignment. And then we increase our power to create reality. And with power, we need less force. And that's, that's where the magic comes into it, right? Like we're raised thinking that in order to make something happen, we have to force our way through society. We have to force our way through reality to make it happen. And the more powerful we become, we realize that not a lot of force is necessary if we, you know, have the power and that power comes from being in alignment. I love it. And, and you know, kind of to play off that, to give some people some tangible tools, what are some daily practices that you utilize? Is it, do you, are you doing these visualizations? Are you tapping into those feelings, treating things like a memory? Do you have like a set, like if you have a goal, do you have a set routine that you will utilize on a daily basis to close that gap? So I'm, I'm doing the same things that I'm telling you. And it's also, it never really ends, right? We, we all get, we all, get to a level in our life and we get there through our thoughts, feelings, and actions. We, we have all manifested our current state of being. So whether it's great or not so great, you did manifest it through the, the thoughts, feelings, and actions that we're discussing right now. And so recognizing that's important. And so I'm in a great reality, but eventually our goals are manifested realities become, for lack of a better word, boring. And we intend on something else. And so I'm, I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm consistently like going from like being grateful for everything to also having visions of of, you know, what I want to improve in myself and what I'd like to improve in the environment around me. And it is a constant practice. And so everything that I'm telling you is stuff that I am doing. And I do have to practice because being grateful about glass water bottles is, is, you know, one level of the game, but eventually you might have to, you know, elevate yourself so that you're grateful that a relative just passed away. You know, like things, we, we just get better at this game and we're able to, to utilize these, let's call them tactics and techniques at a more difficult, more dynamic level. So I'm doing everything that we're talking about right now and simple things too, like watching the sun come up or watching the sun go down. And in those moments, so an example of like uh, feeling gratitude or feeling love and joy, this is, these are important feelings. And maybe during the day we're, we're in a hectic environment, we do want to set up reminders. And so for me, when the sunset happens, which I've arranged my life so that I have a house that faces the sunset over the Pacific ocean, which is right behind me, um, can't really see it in that zoom, but, uh, the sun goes down and that's a moment that triggers me to, and it happens automatically, but I feel the, the gratitude. I feel the thankfulness of, of the day's light. And I feel the trust, right? Like it's going away. And I trust that it's going to return the next day. 
And so, I mean, I think that that's a, a great DMO for getting ourselves into a positive feeling state is if you watch the sunrise or the, the sunset, associate that with certain feelings. And for me, it's, it's gratitude for the light. It's trust, you know, at, even though it's going away, that it's going to come back. And it's also love for the connection of the light. I love it. And, and so let's just say that somebody is in the Midwest. They're not by the ocean. It's cold right now in the middle of winter. They don't have a good spot to see the sunrise or sunset. And they are stuck in this, this mode of scarcity. And they are experiencing those low vibrational levels of the guilt, the shame, the feeling of stuckness. How do we open that channel per se to allow that abundance to enter? Like, what's the first step? Because somebody could be hearing all these things. They could say, oh, this is great, Rod. Yeah, I can visualize these things, but it's not here yet. How do we open that to have that faith? Because I think that the word faith is, is really the powerful word that you shared there, because we can do all these things, but we don't have faith and trust that it is going to happen. How, how do we close that gap? Sometimes drastic measures are necessary. I mean, I grew up in the Midwest and what I knew is that nobody cared about working out in Michigan 20 years ago. And nobody's a strong word, but very few people. Michigan was one of the unhealthiest states back then. And it probably still is. And what I knew is that in order for me to have the type of gym that I wanted to own, I needed to be where people cared about fitness, which was California, not only California, but Los Angeles. And so I didn't know anything else besides the fact that that, that, that Los Angeles was the environment that I need to be in. And so I disconnected from my life in Michigan. So when I had the, the idea to move to California, it was on my birthday. October 13th and October 31st, I was landing in California. So like two and a half weeks later, after that decision, after it was fall time, everything that you're saying, I walked outside on my birthday and I had a motorcycle. I got on my motorcycle. I remember looking at the dry, the dead leaves spiraling in like a tornado on the ground. Those of you guys who are in like areas where the trees die that, or the leaves die, that, that happens. It's like they spiral around and I was looking and I looked up at the sky and it was like gray skies in October. And I just remember thinking like, what, what is like, I, like, I need to get out of here. What is this? Uh, this isn't where I want to be. And I just finished college and I was at a point where I could transition and then I just did. I shipped my motorcycle to California, took five pieces of luggage on a plane and just landed in a spot, slept basically in a closet for six months. It's closet and couches. Not everybody has this ability, but you can do something, right? My, my, my fiance, Sima, her parents lived in Argentina and there wasn't very much opportunity. They had a family, right? They had three four kids. They had four kids living in a small town in Argentina. And they basically sold every, her parents sold everything in her house and enough to buy plane tickets for all of them to move to Miami. They showed up in Miami with essentially nothing. Her, her dad put them on the sidewalk and said, stay here. They were, they did arrange a hotel, but that fell through. So then they had no place to go and they're sitting in Miami and they're, they're on the sidewalk and the father says, stay here. I need to go find some work. And he goes, and I think he eventually became a valet driver. They did, you know, their parents did what it took and four kids are now raised in America. Seema ended up going to, you know, Ivy league, was it Ivy league schools? Well, she went to one of the best architect schools, did what it took. She went to high school without knowing English. 
which is very, you know, difficult for her, eventually ended up going to one of the best architecture schools, becoming a very, very good architect, working in Santa Monica, designing like some of the best buildings in Santa Monica, working for Elon Musk. And now she, she does Perium because it's an upgrade from all that. But the point is, is that, you know, whether you're a single person or somebody with family, like there's a way for you to make a drastic change. And you do have to think about what is this, you know, put yourself in the future, right? I'm sure parents were like, if we don't go to America with these four kids, they're going to grow up here in this small town. And that's not necessarily the future we want. And so we got to get to the place. And then from there, you can make it work. And so for me, environment is important. And you mentioned, what if you're in the Midwest, you don't have the sun, you don't have this, you better. What happens if you just get in your car? and land somewhere else and then make it work. Do you know how many success stories started with, I came here with $17 in my pocket. When I moved to, to California, I went from having some money saved up to zero very, very quickly. Building from zero is one of the greatest things that you can learn how to do. And if you've never been there in your life, look at it as an adventure. Because when you have been to zero or negative one or multiple times in your life, and I've done it voluntarily after I own the gyms, I said, I don't, I don't like this lifestyle. What can I do? What can I get rid of my muscles? Can I get rid of my looks? Grew up my hair, stop grooming myself. Can I get rid of this? Can I get rid of that? Once you are at zero and rebuild from that, you will never be afraid of failing, of losing your financing finances again in your life. And that's a super valuable tool and asset to have because once you build from zero, you know that you can do it again and you won't be afraid to take steps that would prevent you from living. So do yourself a favor and go to zero and rebuild and then have that tool in your heart that no matter what happens, I'm going to be okay. Because from that security, you can manifest great levels of abundance. I love it, Rob. Yeah, I'm reading a book right now called uh, David and Goliath by Ma Malcolm Gladwell. And basically, the, the theme of the story is that the underdogs find a way if they believe they can find a way. And, you know, one of the examples is this basketball team that everybody was joking at. They call them like the hillbillies from Idaho or something. And they're facing the, one of the best teams in the country. So they knew they couldn't beat them by playing basketball per se. They just did a full court press and just played defense and sold the ball and got layups all game. And they ended up winning the game because they just out hustled the other team is really what it came down to. It gives various other examples of people from seemingly disadvantaged backgrounds, whether it was dyslexia and how a lot of people with dyslexia end up being highly successful business people because they have to adapt in other ways. And so what I'm gleaming from what you're saying is that our perceived disadvantages are one, not always disadvantages, but two, we do have the control to change our situation if we are willing to go back to zero, to have a clean slate and let go of whatever we had before. And oftentimes it sounds like that is necessary to get the clean slate to build a new life. Is that correct? Yeah. And a lot of times the obstacle is the way, right? What you want is in the cave that you fear the most. And so the obstacle, the fears that you have, that's the direction, that's, that's your guiding light. That's the direction that your greatest self resides in. I love it, man. And so on that note, um, you know, we talked about making some changes. We talked about some daily practices, whether it's looking at the sun, having gratitude for the things that we utilize. What are some common pitfalls you see? Because I'm sure that there's people that start on this path and then something comes up and then they fall back to those, those bad, bad habits that they were doing before. What are some common fit, pitfalls you see people making along this, along this journey towards abundance? The trappings of success are, are what those are called. And, and a lot of times when, we, when things work out for us, we forget and we start to 
use our power against our intentions, right? So for example, if we're, if we're chasing something and, and we get it, right? And, and, and what we used to get there was positive alignment and, and feeling uh, grateful and doing the actions to get us there. And then when we get there, we quit doing the activity. We think that we're a Messiah and, you know, God's gift to this planet. And we start feeling like other people aren't as good as us. These are the opposite of how you got to that level. Right. And so it's very easy to go from that to start you know, if you are like that, you're not doing the activity to support your framework of reality. You're also kind of uh, having negative associations with the people in your reality. You know, you're no longer grateful for their existence. You're telling them with your words, with your feelings that you actually don't appreciate them. These people are going to dissolve they're going to stop, you know, they're not going to be supportive to your reality and a fall may be likely. And a lot of the times you may have heard like the higher you climb, the further you fall. That's to our benefit. Right. And, a, and, and success isn't, isn't a straight line up. And I think that we all are here to learn lessons. And so if we have made it and then we fell, like a lot of the times that's for our benefit to recognize, okay, how, like how I created this. So next time I get to that level, I'm going to be able to stop and rebalance and remember what happened last time. And let's try and do it a different time this time. And so we just want to make sure that when we do reach our goals, we are conscious of the, the sort of like the, the Messiah syndromes where we think that we're greater than our current reality. We start to think everybody else is stupid because we've got what we want. And that almost validates ourselves to a degree that we might be thinking uh, too highly of ourselves. We might be spending money frugally. We might be spending relationships, you know, putting st strain on our relationships, just riding them uh, without recognizing that there's two people involved or more than two people, you know, you might be taking advantage of the company that you built. And these things are a creation of yours and they will follow your thoughts, feelings, and actions. And it's very easy to release our focus on them when we get our goals. So what I think is a way to remedy that is when we reach our goals, make sure that we've got the next plan. You know, we, we've got the next intention and that keeps us honest. It keeps us hungry for more. And I'm not saying that we should be in a state of desire and lack all the time because that's a very thin line where we get to where we want to go and then we're just trying we move that line further and we push because that can lead to a whole bunch of other issues but there's positives and negatives to every part of this game right so if we move that line back we move that goal line back it does leave us maybe feeling like we are in a state of lack constantly so we do have to watch that as well, because that's another risk of doing, like moving the goalpost back. 100%. And an example from my own life is, you know, I first joined the Perium team April of 2019. It was like the very end of April. So it'll be coming up on three years. And I remember going to the Perium convention where it was the first time I met you in person, which was summer of 2019, somewhere in July or June, somewhere in that time frame. And I was pretty new to the, to the business at this point. And I remember going there and seeing all these cool people on stage, you know, it was the diamonds and the couple crowns. And in my mind, what I thought I could achieve was diamond. And this is a realization that came to me a few months ago. So I set my target as diamond. And then that was the goal for me. So then when I got that, 
it almost became like I made it and then there was no next step. So this is a whole breaking down of my own uh, journey the past few months, recognizing that I limited myself by the target that I set. I didn't take the time to really sit with what the actual goal was. I just picked that because that's what I saw. And that was kind of my first impression of what I thought was reasonable. So what I've really learned is that I need to set my goals higher than I think I can achieve because if I set it too low, I'm just going to, I'm going to get there and that's going to be it. And then I recognize over the past, it'll be two years ago that I first achieved the rank and diamond. I'll have the best month in my business. And then the next month I'll go right back down to my average. And a lot of those are self-sabotaging myself to kind of stay in that comfort zone and stay where I set that target goal. So it's really interesting to me to, to recognize how powerful the power of intention is. And I know you and Seema talk about this often is that, you know, we want to set the bar at a place that is, doesn't feel out of reach, but is also in line with our goals. And I set the bar too low because that's just all I knew. And I never adjusted as I learned more about the business. And so something I think is important for people to recognize is that we are our own competition and we're also our own source of magic. So if we can find that balance with the goal setting, I think that's a really important piece. I'd love to just have you kind of go into the topic of goal setting a little bit, because I found that I really severely limited myself by setting a standard that was way too low. Yeah. And goal setting is, is I'm, I'm, I haven't, I'm not completely in alignment with goal setting, but really progress, like almost like it's an evolving goal and, and progress is something that brings goal setting into the present state, right? Because goal setting could be like, I'm not going to feel this way until I get to my goal. And then once you get there, you move the bar back as I was just saying, but as you were just talking, I was thinking that progress is a more, uh, more in representation of what I'm thinking about, like what, how we should be relating, how we can be relating to goal setting. So progress being in alignment with progress will allow us every day to recognize the progress that we made yesterday. And then being in align with making progress today and over long term, you will be making progress and, and basically smashing the goals that you kind of set up in your head. And, and like you said, recognizing that the goals that we set and how we meet them, and that's almost like the limit, recognizing that, and then replacing goals with progress, where it's a system of progress, where you're just evolving your ability to attain goals through progress, that'll allow us to do that consistently. And but recognizing that you are at your limit is very important. Even myself, we, so you explained your, your scenario. My living situation is a representation of what I saw was possible in Perium. We used to go to our upline, one of our uplines, Michael and Lucy's place, and they've got two apartments, one on top of each other with windows, floor to ceiling windows facing the Pacific ocean. And when I started going there and we would have meetings there, I would think to myself, this is freaking awesome. Like these people are working Perium, they're, they're crowns in the organization, and they've got a beachfront property where they can look at the ocean. And I started envisioning in my mind what was possible. And the house that I live in now is, is basically like the perfect representation of what I was imagining was possible for me. And so now I'm realizing that this is a stepping stone, right? So, so we want to make sure that everything's a stepping stone because we reach this, we've developed the, the lessons and the skill sets and the faith to be able to keep the snowball rolling down the hill and, and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And we really don't get to have the things that we want unless we help others achieve the things that they want. And so this whole concept of money 
is, you know, I'm positively oriented to that because in order for, for me to have all this, I have to help other people have a lot themselves. And so I'm positively oriented towards it, but I am in recognition of the limit that I set for myself by looking at other people in the same business as me and what they've achieved. And then me basically kind of getting almost the mirror image, but matching who I am a little bit better than their manifested reality. And so now it's about me just building into what is next from here, because ultimately we use, we will get to a place where we don't have a map. Like I had a map of what this living situation looked like. Cause I could see it with them. You had a map cause you went to a convention and you saw other people. Eventually you're going to get to the top of what you've seen is possible. And then it's up to you to develop and envision and build what's possible. And that's where it, it, it advances like that's where the game advances to a higher level and that's where it really gets exciting because it's it's limitless so yeah i guess to comment on what you're saying is let's translate goal setting into an identity with progression and i feel like progression also makes people happy as well and so just recognizing that we're in alignment with progression and feeling the abundance within progression. I love it. And, and like you're saying with the map is that inevitably when you reach a new point, there's, it's going to be uncharted. You know, anytime that we create a new reality for ourselves, there's going to be an uncharted territory. And that's part of the fun of life. If we're always just following a predetermined plan, which maybe we don't have free will, that's another conversation. But if we're just following a predetermined plan, that wouldn't be as fun as being able to unroll the map as we go. And, and like you're saying, you know, for me right now, in my current reality, I'm doing my best to be grateful for what I do have. Because I also recognize that a move to a different environment is inevitable at this point. And the goal or the plan, I should say, um, is for 2023 to buy the homestead. That's the plan for 2023 is to move to either Virginia or Florida and get the homestead going. So along that journey, I'm being met with my own limiting beliefs. I'm being met with my own word choice, which is a big thing that I've been really working on. Um, my self-talk and just how I speak things into reality. Um, I tend to use soft talk as opposed to solid talk. I tend to use negations instead of affirmations, focusing on things that I don't want. So this is something I'm becoming very aware of in my own mind. Um, so I guess just from, just from a personal, you know, kind of going back to the therapy session here, from what you know about me and what we've discussed, I'm sure there's a lot of people on a similar boat to me that are in a position that I have enough money to survive. I have enough money to have a great roof in my head, eat high quality food. But at the current moment, there's not enough left over to really invest into, let's say, the homestead or invest into you know some sort of other investment. What would you recommend in terms of next steps for somebody in my position in terms of changing the mindset and doing the right action? Because I think it's easy to get caught up in distractions as opposed to taking right action. What would you recommend for, for next steps? So I'm going to say something that's probably non-traditional. It's probably something that people haven't heard before, but it's important. Our, this gate right here in our throat this is, it's a gate, right? So our diaphragm is another gate. Uh, and basically we want to take the lower creation powers up into our higher centers. And if this is closed off, then it's, it's going to be difficult for the, that energy flow. And what I've noticed about you personally, Rob, is that you're very, and you mentioned it, you're soft. You're soft in the way that you speak. And I definitely noticed that when you send voice messages, very soft. And I'm imagining that how you talk to yourself in your mind is also soft, just kind of like mellow and no urgency, no belief. If you imagine like a, like the, like Mel Gibson in Braveheart, that's the opposite, right? It's like very encouraging and enthusiastic and this is important and we're on a mission. 
I would say that's the opposite polarity of you and probably the opposite polarity of a lot of people. It was the opposite polarity of me. And I put myself in situation after situation unknowingly that I think led to me having a strong voice and a strong uh, belief in what I say to reality and a belief in what I say to myself. And so what I think would be a practice that you could work with is put yourself in environments where you have to speak stronger. So for instance, I know that you do these, these ice bath things instead of huddling up close to people and talking at like a 12 inch voice about like what they're going to do, like push people back, have them get into a half circle around you so that you have to speak so that your voice travels farther. And when you do that, you're actually going to be enabling yourself to be able to speak to larger crowds of people, right? Because you're going to be trusted that you have that voice. And that's a small thing that if you just remind yourself, I need to speak stronger. So I'm going to put myself in situations where I'm utilizing my voice to impact feelings on other people. This is not only going to build your belief in yourself, it's going to build other people's belief in you. And it's also through your voice, you're going to be able to translate your voice into other people more effectively so that they start to believe that they also have superpowers because that is going to be what you're speaking into them. And the more people around you that you're impacting with your voice, when you're leveling people up with your voice, you're going to be increasing the net worth of your network. And these people are going to translate into your net worth. So you're going to be trusted to speak to people. And that's what business is. Everything is about communication. Everything is about relationship building. So for my analysis on you is to increase the strength of your voice by arranging how you talk to people, stepping back further so that you learn to speak more firmly to other people, which is going to translate how you speak to yourself. You're spot on. And, you know, it, it's funny because I have the same realization that I do. It would be beneficial to have more in-person interactions because I feel like I also speak differently in the in-person setting that I do online and I don't know if it's because of in the online setting it doesn't feel like there is this urgency like when you're sending a voice message it's somebody's going to listen to someone they listen to on that live time per se but I definitely find I project myself differently in my voice and my mannerisms in the in-person versus the online so that's something I'm becoming increasingly aware of is how can I put myself in more of these in-person events so I start to, you know, reprogram my brain to speak more of that way, because like you're saying in the events at Ice and Iron, we're using a circle. And if I'm sitting in the middle, I'm having to project my voice outside. There's cars coming around. So I have to speak louder. I have to speak more to the point. And so it came to this point of how can I create more opportunities to do that? And that's one of my buddies. He just opened up a juice bar. So I've been going there to talk to people about Purium. I just went there for the first time. He just opened a couple of weeks ago. I just went there last week. So I'm saying to him, I want to do this on a regular basis because it gets me more of those reps to talk about these things in person and have the opportunity to you know, work on some of these things and do it in live time. So that's kind of a, a place that I'm more moving towards this year is doing more in-person events because you're spot on is that uh, you know more of that solid talk and avoiding the soft talk is something that I think that I need and definitely a lot of the people I surround myself um, can benefit from as well. Because like you said, the, the words we use are creating our reality. Um, and, you know, uh, I was just doing a workshop last weekend about a lot of these things, word choice and talks about abracadabra um, with my words I create. So really using those words to essentially, like he says, cast spells into creating the reality that we want. So yeah, you're spot on with that one. Something, something I'm actively working towards. Yeah. And some of us need more of the soft talk, right? Some of us might be almost too hard on ourselves. And so they've got the reverse aspect that they, sh they could be working on, but uh, yeah, voice is important.
Love it. Well, let me ask you this. I know that, um, you know, we're kind of coming full circle here, but would love to just talk about some ways that you can utilize some of your practice. I know you do create the week. Are there any sort of meditation practices? You mentioned the visualization thing and things as a memory, other activities that people can utilize to start to kind of reprogram their brains, whether that's through their voice or through their visualizations or anything like that. Any other specific practices? So I'll just answer this from a personal standpoint, personally for me, and this might not be the case for many people, but personally for me, reading has been where I find affirms these concepts. When you read a book, you're essentially implanting almost a lifetime's worth of the author's work into your psyche and reading book after book after book. And it's almost like you're becoming friends with these authors and they're talking to you about the most valuable aspects of what they've learned, right? It's almost like you get the the greatest conversations with these scientists and philosophers and, and people, and you start to adapt those experiences into your life. And so for me, reading is the way that I connect with a lot of these concepts because I can see that many, many different authors have different routes and different maps that they've achieved success or they've climbed out of the depths of hell with. And it allows me to relate that to my life because you do start to see underlying truths, underlying mechanisms that they all utilize, right? And some of those, I've like in all different types of religions and occult practices and, and authors, one of the main themes is that we're creating all of this. And when you think about like, even if you don't think that we're actually creating physical reality, well, we're creating our perception of it, right? Our perception of physical reality, reality we have control over. And it would be a very difficult argument uh, or it's, it's, it's almost not even, it doesn't even matter if reality and our perception of reality is different our perception is going to trump what reality is and our perception we have control of. And so whether we're locked up unwillingly in a jail cell, we can still utilize everything that we were talking about in that scenario. Right. And the people that we know survive things like concentration camps or survive things like being accused of a crime that they didn't commit and put in jail. The people that come out of those resiliently are the people that were able to translate that experience into one that is harmonious with their inner thoughts, their inner feelings and their inner inner activities. And so whatever reality you find yourself in, your perception of it is what matters. And so that's one fundamental truth is that we create our reality. And the other one is because of that, we're responsible for everything seems that everyone that that achieves greatness takes responsibility for that they're not waiting for handouts and so if we are looking at the negative things in our life and we're thinking that they're happening to us and we're not taking responsibility for it then we're going to not realize that we're actually harmonizing to that reality. And we're not allowing ourselves to step into a greater level of existence because we never thought to respond to reality and and choose something different, right? Responsible is the ability to respond. And so if we don't have an ability to respond to reality, we are just going to be compressed by it and depressed by it. And so responsibility is also key to everything. And so for me, it's books. For other people, it might be sitting under a waterfall or meditating or, you know, loving, you know, they might find it within relationships. But if you haven't read books, you know, a lot of us have negative associations with books because of school, 
because the things that we learned in school seem as vacuuming upstairs. I don't know if you can hear that, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, the negative association we have with books, like some of us also get to rewrite that program because if we get to choose our books, it's a lot more fun than being assigned books to read. Definitely. And, you know, to your point, that, that makes me think of a book by Jocko Willink, Extreme Ownership. And that's, that's a book that really was profound to me. And just like you said, kind of owning the fact that we are responsible for every single piece of our reality and to take responsibility for that and also recognize that we have the ability to change that. And I think that's the empowering piece is, yeah, maybe we found ourselves in a scenario that we isn't our ideal life, but taking extreme ownership for the fact that every thought, every decision, every choice we've made has led us to this point. And if we've led ourselves to this point, that isn't ideal. That means we also have the power to lead ourselves to the place that is ideal to that quote unquote dream life, which like you said, is always changing and evolving. There's, there's not like there's an end goal. And I think that's also a big misconception of what we're fed in the traditional society of that. You go to school, you get good grades, you go to college, you get a job, you retire, and then you, you know, that's it. That's the end goal is retirement. And then you start living your life doing what you want to. But if we can recognize that maybe that's for some people, I don't think most people that get to that point say, hey, this is everything I thought was going to be and better. Most people end up, you know, I know a lot of my dad's friends who retired end up getting part-time jobs because they're bored, because their, their goal in life was to retire, and then they don't have a next step. So, you know, kind of recapping everything we've said here is that this is a moving target and in the process of life is not a finish line it's to continue to focus on progression rather than goals which i really like that distinction you made there and so i want to kind of just have you share any final thoughts i feel like we have not covered as it relates to manifesting abundance i actually think we, we did we did quite good on covering a lot of the aspects that are important and I mean, the, the final thought that I would say is if you're listening to this and you start to hear, you know, just noticing positive versus negative mind in the information that comes to us. And the more that we can recognize that negative mind and, and decide that, you know, almost thank it, like, thank you for showing yourself, but I'm choosing something else, right? We want to make sure that our aspects of our thoughts are not ruling us. And that's, be, that's becoming conscious, right? That's becoming self-aware when we become aware of our mechanisms and then we choose how to use them. Without that self-awareness, without that awakened, right? That without, without, realizing how we're working and utilizing our technology as a tool for ourselves, then we're just kind of like a victim. And that's where the victim mindset comes from is because we're not actually utilizing our instrument. We're just letting reality happen to us. And then our reactions happen and we follow the reactions and we're not having any choice. We're not having any responsibility. So this is all about self-awareness, right? Everything in this entire reality that you have constructed around yourself is relatable to your awareness to self. And so pay attention, open your eyes and receive the experience and choose wisely. Love it. Thanks, Rob. And it's funny, I actually have a podcast coming out next week on the topic of self-awareness. So that's a, a perfect transition to the podcast coming out next week. So if you're watching this live on Instagram, thanks for tuning in. And um, if you're watching this or listening to this as the podcast recording itself, I definitely want to invite you to check out all the work that Ra is doing. And I have been very fortunate to be able to work with him over the past few years in the Purium organization. So if you resonated with anything that was said here today and you feel like this is an area on the topic of abundance that you feel like you could spend more time diving into. I definitely want to invite you to learn more about what we're doing. You know, shoot me a message on Instagram or however else you're watching this to learn more about the opportunity that we have. This is a great way that has helped me to shift my mindset to be able to live a life that I can, you know, work remotely, work with great people, learn from people like Ross, Seema, and all the other people in our team and have the ability to work with a company, you know, partner with a company that's going plastic free 
that's sharing organic superfoods, that's focusing on the key pillars of my experience that are, you know, environmental stewardship, nutrition, financial abundance, the really three great pillars that align with this company. So if this is something that resonated with you, definitely shoot me a message. We'd love to share more details about what we got going on because we're just getting started. And Ra, I appreciate all the wisdom that you always share, your life experience and the leadership that you have in the PRM organization and just the leadership you have as a human being. So I appreciate you, my friend. Thank you so much, Rob. It was awesome. Awesome conversation. Glad to be here. Absolutely. And everybody listen, I will put the links to connect with Ra in the description of this episode as well. So check that out. And until next time, appreciate you listening. Have the best day ever. We'll see you soon. Sayonara.